The Elliott School team is very pleased to welcome our guest speakers, Brittany Burrick, Taisley Isaac, and Lori Faith, whose presentation this afternoon is entitled, In Love with Learning Online, 10 Keys to Delight, Persistence, and Attention in an Online Space. There will be some self-reflection activities during the presentation today, so you should all be like the little boy in the picture with a pen and paper really handy nearby. The Ministry of Education has provided funding for this, for the production of this webinar. Please note that the views expressed in the webinar are the views of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect those of the Ministry of Education nor the Learning Disabilities Association of Ontario. We will also be tweeting throughout the webinar. So if you'd like to participate in that conversation, you can send us a tweet by using our handle at LD at school at the bottom of the screen there, or you can use the hashtag, hashtag LD webinar. So that takes care of all our housekeeping for this afternoon. So we can get started with the meat of the presentation. It's now my pleasure to turn over the controls to Brittany, Taisley and Lori. Thank you very much, Susanna. Uh, you are so good at doing that. You should just keep on going right through the presentation. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Lori and I'm a former teacher with 20 years of experience in the classroom. And now I'm at OISE and just finishing up a PhD. Um, I'm about to publish a book about executive functions with Peg Dawson and Carol Ann Bush. And I give lots of talks about learning skills and executive functions. So hello, if we have met before and nice to meet you if we haven't. So a little background about this talk. Well, surprise, surprise, several organizations reached out to me for some guidance on online engagement. Um, of all the many goals we are striving towards as educators, this engagement piece has grown and become more prominent and urgent. And uh, you know what, I'm not going to say silver lining, but darn it, it is a great time to learn more about student engagement. Um, I know a fair bit about engagement through my work on executive functions, but I needed help to really connect it to an online setting. So I dreamed big about the very best two people to help me research and present this topic. And to my huge delight, they both agreed to help. So let me introduce them. Uh, first of all, Taisley uh, is a grade one teacher. She's an OISE graduate who was a student I helped supervise in the program and had then sort of lost touch with. She went out and started teaching. Um, then I started hearing these rave reviews from a faculty member about a teacher who was like, crushing her online teaching. Uh, this faculty member was telling me that her child, you know, who has some learning challenges, was absolutely loving online school. Um, so Taisley, this was Taisley. Turns out she has received some special training through the TDSB and you will see, she is just whip smart, super tech savvy and super creative. She's gonna provide us with some grounded examples today. Um, Brittany is just finishing up a doctoral uh, program in clinical psychology. She teaches a special education course with me at OISE, and she's also getting ready to publish some groundbreaking research on, of all things, the challenges of online learning for neurodiverse students. So how perfect is that? Um, between the three of us, we really hope that we can be of service to you and your work today. Um, now, you the most important people, now about you. Um, as we get started, I want to give you permission as much as possible to just push away all of your online distractions. If you can, shut down your email, close that report. I know you all have a report open somewhere on your desktop. If you can shut that down, shut her down. Uh, silence your phone. You are so important. You are amazing and you have chosen to be here. Um, your learning, especially right now, is really important. Um, your ability to engage children online is a high priority. So if possible, just give yourself permission to focus on only one thing for the next hour, as crazy as that sounds. Uh, okay, thanks. So let's move along. Uh, so we only have one hour together. Um, we're going to try to give you a nice little pop of really essential core psychology. 
um, the knowledge that you'll need and also a practical tool uh, and a good idea for how to use it. So the tool is the 10 keys and you can find that um, handout in the chat right now. We're going to use it soon. So you might wanna open it up and keep it handy. Okay, so let's get started. So everybody kind of lean in, roll up your sleeves, uh, get ready to be active. Uh, we want to tap into your prior experience and your prior knowledge a little bit. So the question to answer in the chat is, what does good engagement actually look like? Like, what is it that you're hoping to see from your students when you look into your screen? So jot an idea or two down in the chat. Think about when you plan an online lesson and you look out at those students, um, and imagine what the perfect engagement is going to be. What is it that you're hoping to see? So I'm just going to take a peek in the chat and I can see, thank you so much. Of course, Ontario teachers are full of energy and participating a ton. And what I see is a lot of, I see focus. I see behaviors like raising hands, smiling faces, maybe a little bit of emotional engagement there. Um, I see a lot of things that we can very easily see children doing in group settings. So thank you very much. Wouldn't this be a perfect world? I'm going to print this out and stick it under my pillow tonight. Okay, so let's move along. Uh, so thank you so much for that participation. I hope that sort of freshens you up. I want to talk a little bit about what engagement looks like, what we know about engagement. Um, so what we know is that engagement is actually expressed across a range of on-task behaviors, but also thoughts and feelings. Um, so this is really useful to us because it maybe stretches our sense of engagement beyond just the behavioral stuff, um, the, you know, following instructions. We can also focus our attention uh, in classrooms. We're working really hard to build this engagement. So we can also focus in uh, our attention on really directly teaching and noticing and naming some of these quieter um, facets of attention. Um, we can try to grow our students um, uh, thinking, like engaged thinking, you know, and even if they're not maybe looking at the camera the whole time, we can really pay attention to how thoughtfully that maybe they're engaging with comments in the chat. Um, or if they're not doing exactly what you have asked them to do, we can pay attention to how much they're bringing their emotions to their learning. And so all of these are really great markers of attention and we can really stretch ourselves to see those things. Also, you may be quite focused on the lack of engagement during whole class lessons, but I wonder if you're as tuned in to engagement that might be happening in other places. So we can look for engagement when we're giving instruction and, and we can watch students to see how they're digging into learning tasks. But we can also notice engagement when they're engaging with adults, maybe just one on one uh, with you if you have a few minutes before class or as they're engaging with you um, in asynchronous contexts. We can also look at their um, school and class uh, community engagement. So um, how they're relating to their classmates. And this might be in places like on a shared um, uh, Jamboard, um, on a shared slide deck. Is there evidence of engagement there? And also just one-on-one -on -one with peers. Often we'll happen into a conversation sort of over here, our students helping each other get things set up um, or supporting each other's learning. So these are some of the types of engagement that we can really look for. Really, it's a little bit like hide and seek. So if you're only looking for engagement in the closet, you might not see it. Um, but if you look behind the curtains and under the bed, so if you really sort of fill out and stretch your sense of what engagement can be, you might find it more often. That's really what we're here for, to kind of help your engagement dreams come true. So here's another way to think about engagement. So some researchers say it looks a lot like love. What a nice way to think about it. Um, engagement, uh, engagement can look like students really attracted to their work, students really persisting in their work despite challenges and obstacles, and taking visible delight in accomplishing tasks. Um, so there's another nice way to think about what it is we're all striving towards. Uh, so now that we have a good shared sense of what we want to aim for and what engagement really is, Brittany is going to get us thinking about what it is not. 
<laughs> yes, I'll take over here. So we really do know that teaching online has been hard. It's been hard in so many ways for so many reasons. And Lori's asking you to stretch and you've already been called to stretch in so many ways, possibly further than you've ever stretched before in this past year with all of the changes, with all that you've been asked to do. And we know that there are a lot of barriers to online learning and teaching in the midst of multiple crises that really aren't in your control as a classroom teacher, but are totally and completely impacting your ability to educate kids. Things like access to technology, things like internet connection, things like quiet, safe spaces for learning, things like public policy, these are all real, they all matter. And today, we want to focus our energy and more importantly, your energy on the things that are in your control when it comes to online learning and increasing student engagement. We want to help give you some tools for your toolkit so that you can feel empowered and more importantly, assured that you're optimizing the chances of success for all students in your classroom, including those with special education needs. So we wanna make it really tangible and useful for you. And that means that we're gonna start by activating an UGG experience with online teaching and online engagement. We all have them probably from last week. We probably have a hundred of them. And I, I want to uh, call you to participate in the chat. Does anyone have anything that they could share quickly in the chat? Oh, noisy back. Annette, Annette's on it. She, she maybe has a lot of them really accessible. Annette's talking about a noisy background, eating while online, multitasking, lounging in their bed. Oh yeah, students just like hanging out in their bed while they're attending your lesson. Does anyone else have any like really salient moments it's parents giving answers to students. Oh, yeah. Parents intervening in any ways. Being distracted like, oh, my phone's here. Oh, there's a fun thing here. Oh, something to look at. Totally. Oh, these are so accessible, eh? These UGG experiences. They're all oh, taking care of pets, crickets. Isn't that the worst? The just like into so thank you for all of your keen engagement. We're not talking to crickets here. We're talking to engaged educators. Thank you. So we all have these really salient UGG experiences, probably a lot of them. <laughs> I'm just laughing at the chat still, all of these UGG moments, we share them, we've all had them, we've all had a hundred probably in the, past, in the past year that we've had. So I, I want you to take some time, we want to give you some time right now to sit quietly and for just three minutes, and think about really in detail an online lesson or routine that you've attempted with low engagement. And, and really give yourself the gift of really intentionally thinking about this. Write down the learning objectives, what exactly you did, what exactly the students did. This is gonna be the foundation of your learning and collaboration with colleagues today. So really dig into it, grab a piece of paper. And for those of you who are watching this recording in the future, you may be tempted to fast forward this three minutes, inhibit the urge, don't do it. You also deserve the gift of digging into it and thinking about this and making your learning today really applied and meaningful. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play some music that's just quiet to help us spend our three minutes uh, digging into one specific salient moment where you really uh, felt like online engagement was poor. Think about, think about it, call it to mind. Um, and I'll give you three minutes starting now.
okay, one more minute. Really flesh out the details of your UG experience. What were you trying to teach them? What happened? Okay, thank you everyone and for diving into that and really taking the time in that three minutes. And I see that there's some uh, questions and thoughts coming into the chat and we will certainly have time at the end to dig into these like really important issues. So right now, hold on to your UG experience. You've just made it in big detail and uh, we're gonna work together today to unlock the online engagement in that UG experience. We're gonna come back to it, don't worry. So we've talked about what engagement and motivation is and what it can look like. And now you've compared it to what it isn't and what it doesn't look like and doesn't feel like. And now we're at the how-to portion of our talk today. We want to share with you 10 keys to engagement and motivation in your classroom. Now, this is basically the distilled version of pretty much everything that we know about how to foster motivation and engagement in students, including those who have special education needs, who have challenges with learning. So uh, it's going to help all students in your class and maybe actually be specifically helpful for your students who are having struggles. So years of research with students and expert teachers tells us that we can increase engagement and motivation if we focus on building students' feelings of competence, I can do things, their sense of belonging, I belong, and supporting their autonomy, I can choose what matters to me. The trick is that when we help our students get these three basic well-being needs met, we unlock their motivation and engagement. You're very likely, I'm certain, that you are already doing some of these things, maybe all of these things, either consciously or unconsciously. Today, we just want to bring them to your attention and make them really conscious and tangible for you. So I'm going to unpack them a little bit more and then Taisley is going to take it away and show you exactly what it can look like to unlock these uh, specific things. So competence, what's competence? Competence means feeling like you can do things even and especially when they're hard. So I feel competent in my ability to present slides on Zoom because I've had to problem solve glitches before and I've done it successfully a number of times. So we build competence by setting students up for success and giving them a chance to overcome challenges and build mastery. Belonging all about relationships and feeling socially connected, both to peers and to educators. It's about feeling safe and cared for, but it's also about feeling like a unique and valued community member. So for me, I felt a sense of belonging and like, ooh, good feelings when Lori introduced me at the beginning of this presentation and highlighted specifically my unique contributions to our team. Ooh, that made me feel like I belonged. Finally, autonomy or the sense that you're able to make your own choices that are right and meaningful for you. 
Susanna and the LD at school team fostered our sense, my sense, our sense of autonomy when connecting with us about doing this presentation. They encouraged us to follow our own research, our own knowledge, and our own passions for this talk. So really, it's no wonder that I feel incredibly motivated and engaged in the presentation of this talk, even in the face of the real pandemic challenges on my life and on my time and on my energy. I feel like I can do it. I feel like I can do this thing. I feel like I belong and I'm important and I have a unique contribution here. And I was able to choose that this was an important thing that I felt like I could do. This service felt important to me and I felt autonomy in being able to provide this service. So we unlock engagement and motivation by supporting students to feel competent, to feel like they belong, and to feel that they have autonomy in our classrooms. Okay, enough from me. Now, Taisley is going to show you how to do it. So before I uh, speak to how I incorporate these keys into my pedagogy, I want to first acknowledge that this is not the only way to incorporate these keys. Like Brittany said, you're probably already incorporating many of these keys into your teaching already. Um, but when Brittany and Lori came to me with these 10 keys and I reflected on my pedagogy, um, I realized that I incorporate many of these into my virtual classroom. Um, so this is my virtual classroom. It's where we start our morning routine. It's where we spotlight students work. And it's also where the students access any of the resources that they'll need throughout the day. Um, so Lori is putting a link into the chat right now. Um, and uh, just take a minute, go explore the classroom. If you already do have a virtual classroom, I recommend you check out the um, human body model um, in the bottom right corner, because I'll be talking about that later. But take a minute, just click on a few different links within my classroom, and then uh, we'll get started. Just like 20 more seconds. Okay, great. If you could make your way back to the call now. Um, so let's start with belonging. Uh, belonging was the thing that I was most concerned about at the beginning of the year because uh, like many of you, um, I have never met any of my students. Um, and so I had this huge question of whether relationships could be developed the same way online as they are in person. Um, and because of this, I tailored my entire um, morning routine and my entire pedagogy around just developing relationships and developing community at the beginning of the year. Um, and one of the ways that I do this is our morning routine. And so um, every morning I greet every student by name. Uh, we then do our land acknowledgement and then we head over to our morning message board. Um, many teachers incorporate academics into their morning message board, which I consider doing. But because I was so consider, uh, concerned about belonging, I decided to have my morning message be purely a uh, message to my students where they can see a glimpse of my personality, a glimpse of my life um, um, that they wouldn't be able to see normally when we're doing online school. Um, and this has even evolved now into students writing the morning message to each other when um, they want to have the music teacher write the morning message. They, um, they, they understand that it's a way to communicate to each other and develop relationships. And so this is just an example of what that might look like. Um, Monday, March 8th, 2021. Good morning. Happy Monday. What beautiful weather we had over the weekend. My dog loved it because we spent so much time out in the sun. Fingers crossed that spring is on its way. Sincerely, Miss I. Um, competence. Competence is hard. Um, normally in a physical school, students have this transition period where um, they 
are either walking, biking, driving to school, and they're transitioning from that home environment to the school environment, which are two very drastic and uh, drastic and different environments. Um, and we know that environments can affect how a student uh, behaves. Um, and so um, in virtual school, they have to make that transition by themselves. They have to switch off the home environment and switch on the school environment. And on top of that, there's often a parent lingering nearby, which is intimidating to students. Um, and so one of the ways that I help my students overcome this barrier is through predictability. Um, so we start every morning um, the exact same way. We, as I mentioned, I greet them all by name. We do the land acknowledgement. We do our morning message. We head over to the schedule and then we have a very structured number routine that we follow. And even this uh, routine at the beginning of the year was not enough. I actually started off the year without a class schedule because all they have to do is be in front of their computer. They don't have to go to gym. They don't have to go to their music class or their drama class. Um, they just need to be in front of the computer and I could be the one to transition for them. And it did not work, especially for my students with exceptionalities. Um, not knowing what was coming next was hard. Just like in a regular classroom, in online school, you need that schedule as well so that the students know what to expect, so that they have that predictability. And uh, finally, autonomy. My students have a voice. Um, I follow uh, inquiry-based uh, pedagogy. Um, and so my students have um, a voice in what they learn. They know that they can say, I want to learn this. They know that they can ask a question and we'll look into it. Um, and one of the ways that I've incorporated this into my online teaching um, is through our interactive inquiry board. Um, and so this is just a website that's made through Google Slides uh, that when you click on different areas of it, it will um, bring up different things that we've discussed in class. So for example, if you click on the question mark, it will show you the different questions that they came up with that they wanted to learn about the body. If you click on, for example, the light bulb, that will take you to the things that they already knew about the body. And if you click on different areas of the body, like the muscles, it will take you to more information about the muscles where you can click on things. And this is things that they said in class. Your muscles help you open your eyes and your mouth. Or for example, when you click on the bones and then on the knee, bone structure. Bones have things inside of them like blood. They are not just a solid stick. Um, so these aren't things that I summarized from what we read or what from videos that we watched. These are things that they, they learned that they vocalized that in class and then I added it to the board. Um, and I actually, at the beginning of the year, I had just like a slideshow of the inquiry things that we had been learning. Um, and I, it was always me who had to reference to it. I'm like, oh, look, I added this to our inquiry board. These are the things that you said. Um, and now that I've made it more interactive, um, the students are coming to me. So like last week, uh, one of the students came to me and was like, why hasn't um, the inquiry board been updated with what we learned this morning? Or another student said, Could, can we learn more about the human body so that we have more places to click on in our um, inquiry board? Um, so they love this and it gives them just an engaging way to have a choice of what they learn um, and for them to then go back and look at what they've learned and explore it more later on. Um, so I am gonna set you up for success. Uh, Lori is putting a link in the chat right now um, that has a template for um, a virtual classroom. Um, so when you click on that link, you'll have to um, sign in on your Gmail, and then there will be a blue button saying make a copy. That will take you to this Google slideshow. Um, it already has it set up as a, as a classroom. Um, and then on the left side, you'll notice two videos. One of them is to make your own virtual classroom and how you can edit my classroom to make it your own. And the second one is if you are interested in making an inquiry board, it's kind of just a quick video of me showing how I made mine. Um, so um, this link will also be sent out later as well. Um, so feel free to um, take advantage of that. So now that, um, you have kind of an understanding of how you can apply those keys into your pedagogy. Um, we're going to do a little bit of a reflection. We're going to practice reflecting on these keys. And so I'm going to go through a lesson plan. Um, and pretty soon you'll notice that a poll will pop up. 
and that poll is going to have um, all the keys listed on them. As I go through my lesson plan, I just want you to check off any of the keys um, that you see in my lesson. So at the beginning of the year, um, as I mentioned, um, I was very focused on building that community. And so we had um, the person of the day and everybody, everybody got a chance to kind of share um, things about themselves. To wrap up that unit, um, we read a book called The Best Part of Me. Um, and if you're not familiar with this book, this book has many different pages in it that are written by students. So for example, sometimes I can move my teeth. Sometimes my grandma can move her teeth too. Did you know baby teeth are smoother than permanent teeth? I can bite and eat with my teeth. I have shark teeth. So does a shark. And my cousin Laura, Alejandro. Um, and after we read this book, um, students were asked to choose their own body part that was unique to them and the, a body part that they love, their favorite body part, and to write about it. Now, this was at the beginning of the year. For, so for some students, they wrote, my favorite body part is my eyes. And that was amazing. Uh, but it also gave opportunity for um, some more writing um, and some students had support with this. Uh, so we have the best part of me is my ears. I like my ears because I can track stuff down and hear birds sing. I use my ears to hear. My favorite part is my eyes because they make me be able to see the world and I can protect my eyes with glasses. Um, so you can start to see that, uh, that they are understanding kind of this, these things that make them unique. I protect my eyes with glasses. I love that. Um, so after we finished with our writing, they then took their writing and turned it into a post or using Google Slides. Um, so most of them were able to type the type their writing up by themselves. Um, and then they had help kind of formatting it and they were asked to take a picture of their body part um, and they put that on their poster. Um, and they're beautiful. I wish I could show you the ones with their faces because they're so wonderful um, and just such a beautiful display of the things that make them unique. Um, and so then we took these posters, we put them up in our virtual classroom and um, we spotlighted them. So we went through each one and um, read them together. So if you haven't already, please submit your poll. I'll give you a few uh, seconds to get that in. Um, and you can also feel free while you're waiting to put in the chat maybe some more details. So uh, for example, I saw this key when she did this or uh, just uh, deepen your reflection a little bit. Okay, we're gonna give you 30 more seconds to fill out the poll. Great, can we close the poll and get the results? Perfect. Okay. Um, so uh, we have people voting for every single one of the key, but the ones you guys are picking out the most are a chance to succeed, um, a way to show off their originality, a sense that their teacher knows them belonging, a way to socially connect with classmates, and choices for how to do things. Absolutely. And I'm just reading a few things in the chat as well. Uh, someone says she addressed all the keys. Seeing their work on display would increase their feelings of belonging. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. So. I'm coming back. I felt like I had a weird technical glitch there. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we want to give you a chance to practice unlocking motivation and engagement for your students, for yourself, and apply your learning by trying some of the keys on your door of your UGG experience. So we're gonna give you another three minutes with some groovy music to think about um, 
whether there are three keys that you could pick out or you could focus on, start with three, maybe there's a lot more that you wanna dig into, but start with three keys and plan how you could use them to unlock your UGG experience and increase your students' motivation and engagement. It really, um, we're also going to ask you to write in the chat what uh, your keys were or what your ideas were, and it will really help you and your colleagues if you can be thoughtful about how you could how you're using your keys for your lesson. So we hope that you come back after these three minutes ready to share and help build knowledge for your colleagues by sharing maybe one key that you come up with in your plan. So first. We're going to take three minutes uh, to just quietly go back to our detailed description of an UGG experience and start trying some keys at it. How could you plan uh, to use some of these keys in your lesson that you've written out? Okay, go ahead. Oh, I see Alexandra's got the ball rolling in the chat. You have one more minute. Think about how you could use these keys and really plan it out. What does it look like to increase predictability and routine? What does it look like? How could you plan to help students know why they have to do things in your lesson? Okay, there's your three minutes. Oh, and I already see the chats going. So um, I encourage you to share one of your ideas for how you unlocked participation and engagement in your class. So um, we're hearing from a special education lens, it's really important to ensure students have accessible text on all slides and sheets so they can succeed. Certainly, that's gonna build their competence. They can be, have competence and uh, be autonomous if they have control over what they're doing in their, in their, um, with the materials that they get from school. Yeah, 
Oh man, I'm going to have to read that. Uh, planning time for teacher, uh, planning time teacher for physical education and visual arts. Three keys I would use social connection with their classmates, breakout rooms. Oh, what a great way to increase social connection through breakout rooms, having them chat while they complete their work. Oh, what a good way to like build belonging that was really accessible when we were in person, but we have to work a little bit harder and a little more thoughtfully to increase belonging virtually, but it can definitely be done choice for how they do things. Oh, perfect. Uh, providing choices for which materials they'd like to use and create and a way to show their originality, providing time for students to share their work within class. Karen, you've got it. Thanks for sharing those in the chat. Breakout rooms are amazing. I agree. Annette's talking about giving them choice, encouraging them, believing in them. Oh, it feels so great to have a relationship and feel like you belong with your educator who believes in you. Modeling expectations helps with competency for sure. Acknowledging that it's okay to make mistakes and learn from your mistakes. Totally, it helps with competence. Knowing that we make mistakes and that's how we learn. Oh, yeah, keep trying, Tannis, trying the breakout rooms, but they don't talk to each other. Maybe they uh, need some more competence building there. Maybe they need some more scaffolding for what to talk about in their breakout room while you're fostering belonging. Predictability and routines, really important for some students, certainly. I wonder if anyone has any really genius ideas for how they included predictability or routines in their lesson that they unlocked. I bet there's someone out there that thinks, oh, my genius. Any other brilliant genius unlocking moments, locksmith moments where you just felt like, oh, I got it. This is how I can adapt my lesson or my routine. Providing visuals along with learning materials. Oh, love that as a way to increase predictability um, and autonomy that you can um, make choices between maybe things on a choice board. Um, oh, I love this. This has been so great. Thank you for popping your ideas into the chat. I know we're a big group and your engagement and attention is, uh, is it's so valuable. So thank you, thank you. Oh, and now they're all coming in. Maybe it took a little bit of time for your fingers to get warmed up on this uh, spring break, including students in morning announcements. Oh yeah, um, go over the schedule in the morning. Oh, you have all unlocked some really good keys for motivation and engagement. So we're about at the end of our time for uh, talking to you, and we're going to head into a time of uh, talking with you a little bit more than just the chat to do some question and answer period. But I um, really appreciate all that you've done and engaged today and, and you that you've done beyond today as educators who are engaged in ongoing learning and trying things out, even when they're hard, even when they don't work, uh, like we've been talking about in the chat. And I hope that you'll take a moment to reflect on a big idea that you're going to take away from your learning here today. If you're with us here live, share your big idea or big aha moment or big takeaway in the chat. And if you're watching this recording in the future, I want you to whisper the big idea to yourself, maybe write it down, maybe share it with a colleague, maybe share it with the Twitterverse, but really uh, think about what the big idea was. And I encourage you to, oh, sorry, Lori. Sorry to interrupt, Brittany. I just see um, right off the hop, there was that real doozy of a great question that landed in the chat just as we began. And I'm just gonna reread it um, because I think all, all of us went, uh oh, we're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to put on our big girl pants to answer this question. Where was it? It was the one about dyslexia and reading, no direct reading instruction. Uh, it's up. Oh, there's so much in there now. Dyslexia okay. and reading disorders are not addressed in this online and completely ignored exactly actually as as per the student words. So how can you engage when there is no direct reading instruction hours? So this is 
This is a really complex and great question. I think that we're all going to have to do a lot of work to uh, sort of backfill on some of the reading skills that are being missed right now. But I do have a little bit of a resource that might help. Um, it's a longer conversation, but I want to offer up a resource that was developed at OISE, it's called um, AT Select, so Assistive Technology Select. And this is a really great um, uh, system where you can go in and enter in where you need assistance. So it may be that you need support um, with some reading or decoding, um, and you can just use the, use the program to sort through and find the right assistive technology. So it might be a, a bit of a support, it's not the full answer, but it's a start. Um, so I just didn't want to ignore that question because it was a really good one. No, thank you, Lori. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. We actually have an article about how to use AT Select, how it's designed, how it can help you pick out the perfect assistive technology for your student in particular. So I will include a link to that article as well in my email out to you all tomorrow. Um, so as was already said, uh, that's all the time we have for the presentation, but I'm sure there's a lot of everybody's wheels are turning and we have a lot of questions. We do have some time to pick the brains of these genius women here. Um, so if you do have a question, you can either put it in the question box, in the chat box. Um, but let's just begin with some of the things that I'm seeing pop up here. Ah, here's one. Feelings are important. Reading facial expressions help us get to know each other. How do you do that online, especially when students don't want to turn on their cameras always? Mm -hmm. So maybe Taisley can take that one because she is used to having all those little faces in the classroom with her. <laughs> yeah, um, that's a really great question. Um, you know, like we can't tell anyone to have their cameras on. Uh, many of my students choose to either have their cameras on or off. Um, but I think it starts with knowing the student. Um, you have to be able to know the student and know how they normally react so that you can pick out those things still. You can see um, maybe they're not being as responsive as they normally are, and then you can check in with them. Um, you know if that's a student that you have, like if they're not very like chatty normally, like that's a student that you have to prompt to get them to, get them to respond anyways. Um, you have to you have to know the student first, um, which is tricky, uh, but it's um, it's something that's really important to many different parts of your classroom, not just managing their emotions as well. So true. So our next question uh, comes from the chat. Uh, Again, Taisley, I think you're the expert on this as well. There's one that says, how do you keep kindergarten students engaged? It's so hard for them. They're short attention spans. They're not used to staring at screens like the rest of us. What tips do you have for that? Yeah. Um, you could, there's a lot of different things that you could do. I'm grade one and a lot of my students are very, um, they're above, they're above grade level. So this isn't, uh, something that I've had a huge issue with, but I have a few students who do have trouble um, kind of staying at the screen all the time. Um, and so I think it's keeping in mind how long their attention span is um, when you're doing your lesson planning. Um, so we started off the year very, like with very short periods. Um, so it was very short lessons and then gave, gave them longer breaks and we slowly worked their way up um, so that they were spending more on screen time because we know we do have to meet that um, minimum requirement. Um, so that's one thing, but then also just giving them a chance to do things that aren't right in front of the screen, um, giving them like a little break like, oh, go find something that starts with the letter this or go start, uh, go find something, go find like for math, you could do go find 10 of one thing, go find, um, and then you can do your lesson around that. Um, and even sometimes we just do that as a community circle as well. Um, like 
go find like if it's a holiday or something like go find something green because it's St. Patrick's Day or if you don't have a pink shirt on pink shirt day go find something pink for example. Um, so just giving them those chances to move around and sometimes you'll see on their faces that like the lesson just needs to wrap up and listen to them uh, because it doesn't help to uh, keep on doing the lesson when you can see that they're like <laughs> uh, so listen to your students they they know they they know what's best for them well uh, you can see what's best for them uh, from how they're reacting to you as well uh, just to touch back on the um, independent reading question that we had there's no just direct instruction of reading um, online right now I saw in your schedule you had time allotted for independent reading and like small group work. How do you find that works with your students? Yeah, um, so I have them broken up into different guided reading groups. So I do guided reading with um, the students that I consider more at risk um, every single day. Um, and then the students who, because I, I had many students who started um, the year at a grade three reading level. So they do have more silent reading time than the other students because they have the skills to be able to do silent reading. Um, so every morning I start with the, um, the students that guided reading with the students that are um, at risk. Um, and I have all of them except for two at a grade one level. Um, so it is definitely possible to implement a guided reading program. Um, and because it's that, again, that's that routine, um, they know every single morning at 9 a.m. they're signing in for their guided reading. They know they're starting with their reading. Um, we don't do breakout rooms for that just because I have a few students who can't access Zoom. So I actually don't have access to breakout rooms. So I just have it scheduled so that the other students have asynchronous time during that. Wonderful. Um, I have a question from a teacher who is struggling because she was a, an in-person teacher and is now pivoting to online. They were right in the middle of writing their own classroom book based on the song, The Cat Came Back. How can they continue doing this virtually? Um, I think that would depend how you're setting, like how they're, like the students are writing each page. They would definitely depend on how you're doing it. Um, you'll, if you might've noticed in my uh, in virtual classroom that there were books on the board, those were written by students. And those are just Google Slides. Uh, so the students did that completely on their own. Now they did have setup because we did, like we started working with Google Slides at the very beginning of the year with the best part of me, um, that thing I was showing you earlier. So they are very familiar with how to use Google Slides. Um, so most of them did those completely by themselves because they have that skill set already. Uh, but in Google Slides, you can make it as a book. Um, and then just like you publish your classroom to the website, um, you just publish the book and then there's a link for that book. So it's definitely still possible to make a book um, online and it actually makes it even cooler for them because it's it's published, like it's online. It looks like a finished copy, like it looks like an actual book. Um, so it's very cool for them. That sounds great. And uh, oh, Janet <laughs> updated us a little. They're writing each, they're each writing their own verse. Yeah, so and... then what you could do, um, what, what grade did she say? I'm not sure. Grade three. Uh, <laughs> so you could technically get them to work on a slideshow together. I've done that with grade fours and fives before. It does get a little tricky because accidents happen and students accidentally delete slides. So with my grade ones, I never have them working on the same slideshow just because that can cause a lot of emotions. Um, so you could get them to each have their own slideshow and put their verse in the slideshow and then you combine them all together at the end. Um, or you could get them to do their writing and send it into you and then you could put the book together. We did that when we did our person of the day is I just put all of their, all of their pages together. Wonderful. And I think we've got time for one more question from the group. We actually had someone share their UGG moment um earlier with um they would be giving out the instructions to their students our group of students and get constantly interrupted and she was saying you know i will answer all your questions at the end and then the end came around and everyone said i don't understand <laughs> how do you more effectively 
explain assignments and support your students like that. Um, visuals are great. Uh, we know that especially for students with exceptionalities, um, having a visual cue of the different steps is extremely helpful. Um, explain it more than once. Um, I usually explain it two or three times before I even let them get to their questions uh, because they do need that repetition. Um, but it's it's okay for them to ask questions. Like the fact that they're asking you questions is great. Um, the fact that they're making sure that they need that clarification is okay. It's okay. Um, the, the worst would be is if you give the instructions, they go, okay, and then they just they just sit there, right? Um, so, but I do recommend having more than one way that you're showing them the instructions. So either visuals um, with the oral, um, maybe even show them like a model it um, so that they can kind of see if they have an idea of what exactly they're supposed to be doing. They've already seen you do it. Um, yeah. Wonderful. I like how you reframed that UG moment as maybe it was a good thing. Mm -hmm. They were asking questions, they were there. Um, you know what, I want to sneak in one last question since you were so quick there. How can you teach students to access all this different technology, the slides? Are you expecting them to get help from their parents or are they doing it independently or is it a slow release of responsibility? How do you tackle that? Slowly, very slowly. <laughs> um, you can't expect their parents to help because not every student has their parents there to help. Many, many of them might. Uh, but you also don't want their parents helping necessarily. You want them to develop that independence uh, because next year they're not going to have their parents right beside them holding their hands. Um, so you do want to develop that independence and you also don't want to assume that they have their parents there helping them. Um, so it's very slowly. Um, so for example, when we did the best part of me photo with the uh, Google Slides, um, if they got their thing just like typed in, and that was great. I added in the picture, I helped them. I said, okay, this is like with every student, I sat down with them individually and went, okay, where do you want your name? What font do you want your name in? And they saw me do that with them. Um, and now they're they're creating those things on their own. It's, um, I'll sometimes kind of set up the document already, like with the um, place for the title and with the place for the thing, because you can do that very easily through Google Classroom um, and then just make a copy for everyone. Um, but definitely slowly modeling um, and also small groups um, and um, even like at the beginning of the year there would be times where I'd take like even just like two or three students and be like okay this is how you do it we're gonna do you're gonna each get a chance to try it. Wonderful well that is officially all the time we have for today so we're gonna end the webinar now but if you are still in the chat with questions please let us know. Um, we will try to answer all the questions we receive. And you can either email us at info at ldatschool.ca or reach out to us on Twitter using the hashtag or sending us a direct message. There are so many ways to get in contact and we always love to hear from educators. You guys guide everything we do. So tell us what you need from us. Tell us what you need answers for. Anything you need help with, that's what we're here for. We also have a, another webinar coming up next month. It will be on May 20th, hosted by Dr. Laura Gerber, and she'll be presenting on recognizing and understanding girls with ADHD. Uh, you can register for that webinar if you're interested by clicking on the link in the follow-up email tomorrow, or if you visit our Padlet, the uh, registration is there as well. And we're super pleased to announce that we will again be hosting the Educators Institute this year on August 18th and 19th. It will be virtual again to keep you all safe. Um, so we hope that you join us online for these two days of learning. Uh, we have two keynote presentations, four interactive workshop sessions with live Q&A, and the opportunity to virtually interact with our sponsors and exhibitors. And if you like today's presentation, you're bound to like Educators Institute this year because one of our keynotes is being presented by Lori Faith. So be sure to follow us online, uh, either on Facebook, Twitter, or just visit the website and you'll learn all about when those tickets are available and how you can get one. So on behalf of the whole LD at School team, 
I'd once again like to thank Brittany, Taisley, and Lori for their presentation. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us for this presentation as our audience. Um, tomorrow, we will be sending out the presentation slides, all the handouts, and a survey. And then three weeks after this, you will get a link to the recording as well. Um, after looking at this chat, I'm also going to compile all the helpful hints that you've shared with each other so you can come back and look at that whenever you need to. Um, so please help us out by doing the survey and following us on all social media. And other than that, enjoy the rest of your day and thank you so much for participating.